Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. In Ukraine, where Russia's brutal war has left a deep trail of destruction, housing has become a critical issue. With over 250,000 buildings destroyed, many Ukrainians have been left homeless. In this episode, we explore the contributions of the government, local authorities, NGOs and volunteer initiatives to address the housing crisis. We will examine the approaches they use and discuss the challenges faced by those who have lost their homes. We'll also touch on why the country's housing sector needs radical changes. We begin with the stories of real people who have faced the consequences of war firsthand, with their homes seriously damaged or destroyed. 59-year-old Natalia from Bucha not only lost her home during the war, but also her loved ones. Her husband was killed by a Russian shell, and their house was destroyed. After the city was liberated, Natalia returned to find her home in ruins. The wall had cracked and the staircase had collapsed. The building was declared uninhabitable and the authorities promised to fund the construction of a new home. However, the process stalled at the foundation stage due to an unscrupulous contractor who hired unqualified workers. Eventually, the project resumed, but Natalia had to file a complaint with the prosecutor's office, leading to an investigation into the contractor's ties with the local administration. The second story is about Tatiana, a student from a Kiev suburb. She and her family were forced to flee their home when the war began. They left their ground floor apartment, which was damaged during shelling. Upon returning, the family had to pay for numerous expert assessments and repairs themselves. Tatiana's family couldn't receive compensation under the state program for restoring damaged housing because their home was originally an extension not officially registered as a residential building. An alternative solution emerged. A developer promised to restore their home by the end of 2024, although no specific deadlines were given. Currently, the family is living temporarily nearby, on the same street where their damaged apartment is located. They hope the developer will fulfill the promise, and they can return home. Anna and her husband bought a house in a small town in northern Ukraine shortly before the war began. They planned to move in early 2022, but the first residents of their new home were uninvited Russian soldiers. The military took over the house and used it for their purposes. In March, the house was damaged by a Grad missile, affecting the roof, fence and an extension. When Anna and her husband returned to their town, they applied for a government program to compensate for the restoration work. Officials delayed the approval until most of the repairs were already done. The commission estimated the remaining repair work at approximately 1,200 euros. By that time, the family had already spent much more, as waiting for a year and a half would have prevented them from completing the repairs before the next heavy rains, which would have worsened the damage. Olga, a 33-year-old housewife, lived with her husband and two young children in a three-room apartment in Mariupol. In 2014, they bought the apartment from a family fleeing the war initiated by Russia. For nearly eight years, the apartment was a safe haven for the family. When Russia's invasion began on February 24, 2022, they decided to flee to Olga's mother's village near the city. The family took the bare minimum with them. Later, they learned that their apartment was destroyed. The balcony, loggia and bathroom were burned down. Now the family lives in Portugal, feeling lost and not knowing what to do next, as they have nowhere to return to. Moreover, Mariupol is occupied by Russian forces, and the family has no other housing in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government is trying to support those who have lost their homes. 
it has launched several programs to help those whose homes were damaged by the war. Some of those mentioned in our stories received funds through the e-recovery program. Under this program, the authorities provide compensation to those who can prove their housing was damaged or destroyed. Applications can be submitted through a mobile app. There are no strict deadlines for submissions, but they must be filed during the war or within a year after it ends. Approximately 25 million euros have already been allocated for housing repairs. As of spring 2024, 84,000 Ukrainians have applied, with 49,000 already receiving payments. About 33,000 applications are still being processed and almost as many have been rejected. In early 2024, to help people acquire new housing to replace what was destroyed, the government started issuing so-called housing certificates. The idea is that any Ukrainian citizen who lost their home due to the war is entitled to receive at least part of the amount needed to purchase new housing. This applies to those whose homes were completely destroyed and those whose houses were damaged beyond repair. If the actual cost of the new home exceeds the amount specified in the housing certificate, the recipient must pay the difference themselves. The certificate can only be used by the owner of the destroyed home or their heir. The owner cannot sell or gift the house for five years. Currently, around 12,400 people have applied for these certificates, and 5,400 have already been issued. The government promises to process applications within 30 days, although in regions with frequent shelling, the timelines may be longer. The program had its limitations. Until recently, housing certificates were only issued to those who lost their homes in government-controlled territories. This meant that people who lost their homes in places like Mariupol, which was largely destroyed by Russian shelling and is now under occupation, had no practical way to access their right to compensation. The problem was the lack of a mechanism for remote assessment of destroyed housing in temporarily occupied territories. Now the government promises that this issue will be resolved not only for Mariupol, where the Russians are demolishing destroyed homes and building new ones, but also for other occupied territories. To address this, a pilot project has been launched to confirm housing destruction through remote sensing, specifically aerial photography. The project began in Melitopol, a southern city occupied by the Russian army at the start of the 2022 invasion. So far, a special commission has reviewed only four applications for compensation for destroyed real estate. In two cases, the victims have already received housing certificates for compensation. It's important to acknowledge that officials have been slow to address this problem. Since the southern regions of Ukraine were occupied by Russian forces, more than two years have passed. This issue affects many people. Before the full-scale invasion, Mariupol was home to nearly half a million people, 80,000 of whom remain under occupation. In March 2022, the city suffered chaotic artillery and airstrikes by the Russian army resulting in 90% of the city being damaged or destroyed. Officially, at least 25,000 people were killed, leaving roughly 400,000 people effectively homeless. Throughout this time, thousands of people have attempted to travel to Mariupol from Ukraine and European countries via Russia to return to whatever housing they had left. However, this journey is fraught with difficulties and risks to life from the occupying authorities who persecute anyone suspected of ties to Ukraine. Social media in Ukraine is filled with complaints about the lack of affordable housing. Many people are struggling to find a place to live as there are not enough available or affordable rental options and prices are high. The issue of housing affordability is not new, but the Russian invasion, which has wiped some cities off the map, has exacerbated it many times over. Hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to leave their homes and are now in desperate need of shelter. At the beginning of the invasion, displaced persons were settled in any suitable premises, including school gyms, 
and university dormitories. But these were temporary solutions, and after a few months, many were asked to leave as gyms and dormitories were needed for student. Despite loud declarations from government officials about the inadmissibility of evicting displaced persons without providing alternative housing, little real action was taken. Instead of a systematic approach, the government opened several showpiece housing villages with trailers as temporary housing, often supported by Western donors. However, these settlements could accommodate a maximum of a few thousand people, while the number of those in need of housing was about a hundred times greater. Many of those who left their homes due to the threat of fighting found refuge with relatives, friends or acquaintances. This couldn't go on indefinitely. Eventually, many had to move into rented housing. The private rental market in Ukraine shelters 60% of displaced persons, and this number is only growing. At the same time, displaced people often face discrimination due to language, having children, pets or disabilities. Unlike in European countries, where the rental housing market is regulated, the Ukrainian government largely ignores the rental sector even during wartime. The housing mechanisms proposed by the authorities fail to meet the demand, causing many displaced people to spend more than 70% of their income on rent. Worse still, high rental costs are forcing people to return to dangerous regions under shelling, simply because they have a place to live there. Meanwhile, in relatively safe cities, Rental prices have skyrocketed due to the influx of displaced persons, relocated businesses and international organizations. At some point, this becomes problematic for local residents as well, as rental prices soar. Some commercial companies have converted residential spaces into offices, putting additional pressure on the rental market. The largely unregulated rental market operates in the shadows, meaning that most landlords do not pay taxes and can arbitrarily increase rent, evict tenants, or interfere with their private space. Many people facing these challenges are trying to find solutions, as seen in social media discussions. Often, these discussions revolve around the idea that private developers should be given more funds to build more housing. However, these suggestions are rooted not in a real analysis of the situation, but in the neoliberal mantra that a free market will solve all problems if left unimpeded. The underlying assumption is that the state is inherently incapable of effectively providing housing. Another recurring theme in these spontaneous online discussions is the moralization of the issue, shifting the blame for the housing crisis onto landlords who are perceived as unsympathetic to those displaced by the war this misdirects responsibility away from politicians and the government who regulate this sector onto landlords. The housing crisis persists not simply because landlords are greedy. It would be naive to expect landlords to act irrationally benevolent. Such a solution is neither reliable nor sustainable. Fundamentally, Housing affordability is a result of political decisions regulating the sector and the role of housing in the economy. While it would be ideal to have fair-minded landlords, the only long-term solution lies in structural political changes. Is there potential for such changes? Currently, the unregulated rental market reflects the blindness of local and national policies to issues of spatial gentrification and housing regulation in the interests of vulnerable groups. Instead of housing and land management reforms, Ukraine continues with inefficient, unjust and subsidy-dependent housing policies. The situation is further complicated by the authorities' reluctance to utilize vacant private properties. In Ukraine, particularly in western regions and Kyiv, a significant amount of housing is used not for living, but for capital investment. It often seems the government lacks the competency to regulate the housing sector and is not eager to develop it. This results from a lack of housing policy and specialized institutions. Government bodies prefer to shift responsibility onto one another, 
officials wait for new donor funds and rely on outdated pre-war realities instead of focusing on the current needs of the people. It is no surprise that old methods do not work. Although the authorities recognize the housing problem, their measures are insufficient and many approaches do not promise a solution in the near future. For example, the government's attempt to stimulate demand by offering subsidized mortgages does not lead to an increase in affordable housing, but rather to a new wave of price hikes, reducing housing affordability. Decades of governmental silence and inaction have allowed developers and their lobbyists to impose their discourse, replacing housing policy with construction policy. Although the war has destroyed many homes, construction has resumed in some cities. Due to migration, there is increased capital pressure on major cities away from the front line. This creates new risks, such as the resumption of economic displacement of vulnerable groups and the absence of principles of social justice in the recovery process. These trends continue the pre-war logic. The weak capacity and unwillingness of municipalities to manage spatial changes have led to the privatization of urban spaces or public resources by capital for profit. Privatization limits access and increases usage costs, as seen with social dormitories, the demolition of historical buildings, the eviction of communal cinemas, the lack of social infrastructure, and aggressive densification. All these are real processes of economic displacement, unregulated by society. Let's take a closer look at the history of housing in our region. In the countries of the socialist bloc, socio-spatial disparities were significantly lower due to state control over construction, non-market housing distribution, and restrictions on its exchange. The standards and parameters of new apartments were meticulously defined based on the needs of the population. The state monopoly on land meant uniform land costs across the city, and usage fees did not depend on location. The 1990s and 2000s saw a period of active privatization, both of housing and other real estate. This allowed residents to stay in their apartments, but led to a shift from a system of universal welfare to one based on private ownership. Although private home ownership is the dominant model today, an adequate property tax has yet to be implemented in Ukraine. This creates a serious imbalance in the housing market. It's evident that property and land taxes in Ukraine are disproportionately low. While in the US, local budgets derive over 70% of their revenues from property taxes, in Ukraine, this tax accounts for only about 3% of local budget revenues. Inadequate taxation on property and assets has far-reaching consequences for the housing sector. It creates opportunities for new gentrification and the emergence of islands of wealth amidst a sea of poverty that are uncontrolled by the state or society. Astonishingly, developers who already benefit greatly from the existing conditions want to push even further. In Ukraine, there are proposals to build so-called private cities. These cities would supposedly operate without municipalities and social responsibility. The mere emergence of such an idea indicates a troubling phenomenon, the lack of understanding of a city as an integrated system. For the lobbyists of this concept, entire aspects of real urban life, such as social life and many economic factors, remain a blind spot. Each private city seeks to consume the cultural and infrastructure resources of the real city without bearing the costs of their maintenance. Another alarming topic is the prospect of large-scale reconstruction of residential areas in major Ukrainian cities. Even if the war's destruction ceases, there is a threat from private capital, which is guided by the concept of so-called comprehensive reconstruction of outdated housing. The idea is straightforward. It involves relocating residents and demolishing typical housing, particularly the Khrushchevkas, built in the Soviet era, mainly in the 1950s and 60s. Private capital intends to replace them with more profitable buildings. In other words, the past location of these Khrushchevkas on the city map was unrelated to land value because all land was state-owned, 
implementing the comprehensive reconstruction idea would lead to income-based spatial stratification, creating a polarized city, a phenomenon previously limited by the low mobility of the housing stock. Supporters of comprehensive reconstruction might exploit the fact that part of the housing stock in Ukrainian cities was destroyed by Russian shelling during the war. Developers won't need to negotiate with residents or find ways to relocate them since many have already fled their homes due to the conflict. Parliament has introduced bills on the reconstruction of outdated housing, which curtail guarantees for people living in such housing. It remains unclear where these people will be relocated after their homes are demolished. Essentially, this could become an example of reconstruction through displacement. Unfortunately, this practice overlooks the possibilities of improving, adapting and densifying areas while respecting existing infrastructure, urban communities and spaces. Responsibility for developing common infrastructure is shifted to urban communities which in turn lose the ability to allocate revenue from rising land values for social housing, transportation, education, and aid for displaced persons. Commercial development will strengthen its influence, while communities will lack tools to regulate development and create balanced neighborhoods. Gentrification and displacement will dominate the logic of restored quarters. In Ukraine, the need for reforms is often discussed. However, over the past decades, it has generally been assumed that these should be changes prioritizing market mechanisms and minimizing regulation. But the approach to managing housing and land needs to change in the opposite direction, toward more regulation. Many international organizations working in Ukraine on housing issues advocate for the creation of municipal structures that operate in the interests of local communities. However, this meets resistance from officials. Such an approach contradicts the current policy of deregulation and the withdrawal of municipalities from the control of property and land. It's already clear that if we rebuild cities based on old principles, we'll only create new problems. Paradoxically, giving property ownership to low-income individuals will reproduce a situation where people are unable to maintain their homes and finance timely repairs. In 40 years, new buildings will fall into the same disrepair as most Khrushchevkas today. This approach addresses the symptoms, not the cause. The lack of resources for many to maintain their own homes. The expectation that owning property ensures people's well-being threatens to repeat the privatization mistakes of the 1990s. We need to reconsider the balance of municipal and state housing to create mechanisms for managing them in society's interest. Even with massive reconstruction, the issue of housing will resurface. Current construction projects fail to consider social stability, local economies, identity and sustainability. The risk lies in so-called renewal through demolition, leading to displacement and the disruption of social ties. Tax reform is also necessary. Without changing property taxation, we will lose urban land and cities will become commodities for the wealthy. Cities need to preserve land value, favoring long-term leases and developer taxes over quick profits. Sustainable housing management models should replace the outdated post-Soviet housing maintenance services. Developing social rental housing is crucial. We need to normalize renting and stop futile attempts to stimulate private ownership. One approach is to regulate the rental market adequately, long-term contracts, rent control, and public awareness of tenants' rights. Another approach is large-scale social housing construction programs, accessible not just to the poorest. This would force the private sector to improve quality and compete on prices. Society would gain the ability to integrate people and set housing environment standards. Post-war reconstruction in Europe relied on social housing and housing cooperatives. The same is needed in Ukraine. The sooner our society realizes this, the sooner people will be ensured a roof over their heads. Social housing in Ukraine is something that international donors can finance. Recovery cannot be just without addressing the housing issue.
The logical conclusion from all this is that Ukraine's housing sector needs radical changes. The country urgently needs a fair and effective system that protects the interests of local communities, the majority of residents and displaced persons, and does not allow capital to dictate its terms. This podcast relies on credible sources, which are detailed in the description. For further reference, you can access the materials through the provided links.